So, chapter eight, atomic structure. Huh. I thought it was named atomic physics. <laughs> atomic structure covers the uh, hydrogen atom, uh, or mainly the hydrogen atom. Later in the chapter, we also cover topics that relate to multi-electron atoms, like helium, lithium. That's as far as I remember. <laughs> Beyond that, I have to refer to a periodic table. So the good chunk of physics content in this chapter is in section 8.1, the hydrogen atom. And I will say the level at which OpenStax textbook covers the hydrogen atom, I think this is at the, just the right level for lower division class. Um, as you will see in lecture, I won't go in any more depth than uh, what you see discussed here, which is that, you know, this is wrong, <laughs> that this is the Bohr model, the semi-classical model. This is not how we understand the hydrogen atom now. You will see the more correct picture later on. And your textbook does give you the three-dimensional version of Schrodinger equation. And um, I do also mention this in lecture. And then I tell you enough to say, um, we're not solving for this. It's a way out of our league for try to uh, solve this. So we are not gonna solve it. And um, so when you do see this, uh, this form of a Schrodinger equation tackled, you're going to see it tackled in the spherical coordinates. The Laplacian here can be expressed in spherical coordinates. You can write your wave function solution in terms of separable solutions um, as a radial wave function, depending on only R and theta and uh, angular wave function, depending only on theta and phi. And, um, and that's all upper division content. In an upper division quantum mechanics class, that's like a quarter of a semester that they, that they spend on solving this uh, simple one over R potential. Um, so, so at the, the state at which your textbook leaves you at, that's I think the level at which you need to know. And that's uh, the coverage you will see in the textbook. And oh, um, coverage that you will see in the uh, lecture. And one thing that I want to highlight is um, in the lecture, I mistakenly call this angle theta. I use the correct label because this uh, angle should angle from G should be labeled as theta. Your mathematician are wrong. They should be using theta, not B. Um, but this angle is called a polar angle. I think in lectures, I refer to this as azimuthal angle. That's wrong. This angle is azimuthal angle. Um, so the angle from the z-axis is what's called the polar angle. <laughs> um, I think when I was doing lecture, I got my terms mixed up. And, um, and so I do uh, encourage you to watch out for, when you look at these formulas, do watch out for a different convention among mathematicians who use the theta for the azimuthal angle, xy plane angle, and phi for the polar angle in physics, in any physics class from here and on, you're going to see this a consistent convention. It's just something that, I don't know, mathematicians are wrong, we physicists are right. I don't know what more to tell you. <laughs> so, so yeah, this is a, the form of the separable solution. And uh, these solutions, it turns out, can be characterized by integer parameters. That's what we call quantum numbers. N, L, and M. These are um, orbital quantum numbers. And, um, and your textbook will describe these solutions without going into detail. And that's, uh, I think, a perfect for this lower division level class. Uh, and the, the limits on this, each of these quantum number values. Uh, do uh, kind of learn these uh, conditions on the quantum numbers, because that's, I think, something you should know. And uh, these are also later used to explain some of the features that you might have learned in chemistry. So, and so, and so your textbook gives these uh, radial wave functions. And just like with, um, just like with the simple harmonic oscillator solutions, you don't have to memorize this. If you have to do anything with any of these, I'll give them to you. Uh, I think in some of the homework questions, you might be doing something with this ground state, like calculating the expected value for R, the distance at which the, um, the average electron distance from the proton 
Um, so I will give you the wave function solution and then ask you to go through the expectation value calculation uh, process. So, so, you know, similar to what you've done for simple harmonic oscillator. So, so yeah, um, spend some time on these and yeah, and uh, um, kind of wonder at the weirdness of this being the magnitude of the angular momentum, that this is not anything that you would have expected classically. Um, your textbook does try to give you some uh, figures to help you understand that kind of uh, the model that they are drawing is think of the G component of angular momentum as the projection onto the G axis and the magnitude as being this. And uh, I think do they uh, have this. Sometimes you can think of this is in a kind of a spinning vector model. And I will just leave you at this, that the spinning vector model, it does give you some great uh, grounding for intuition. But one caution about any kind of model in the area of quantum mechanics is that all intuitive models have a breaking point. Um, with the quantum mechanics, really the only thing you can rely on to the end is the mathematical representations. The mathematics, they don't break at any point. They, they are correct as it stands. The, the, any kind of prediction you want to make using expected value calculation or whatever, or eigenvalue calculation, it will all be perfect. Um, the models that you use to help gain intuitive uh, understanding of the, some of the things you see, in some areas they work well, but there will always be a kind of corner cases where you can see that the model will give you the wrong result. And in those cases, I say, forget about the model. Models are helpful guides. They're not meant to be the actual representation of the real world. So what represents the real world are the mathematical expressions. There's no other substitute for that. So yeah, all these are good to know, um, especially for those of you who might uh, not have taken chemistry because this S orbital, P orbital, D orbital, that's kind of chemistry specific term. So good to learn. Um, and yeah, this is one of those models, kind of trying to think of the different projections of angular momentum value in terms of different orientation of the angular momentum vector, which again, uh, in some context, it can be helpful in helping you understand these different quantized values, these quantized angles. Um, but do be mindful of when models yield wrong results. It, that does happen and don't be surprised when it happens. Um, yeah, and this is the kind of spinning vector model, uh, I think. Yeah. And, and I think uh, um, to spend some time on this uh, part, I think uh, I have some homework questions where you do basically this calculation. Um, and one thing, that um, one help that you are given in the homework question is, I think I do kind of repeat this information in the question. Um, but you know, if you've seen it already and you are seeing it for the second time, it will help you answer. And uh, one of the kind of fun thing here is that in terms of the radial distance of the, the wave function, there's a difference between the most probable radial position and the average position. I think average position, I think is farther out than the most probable position. So one of those things where you kind of do the calculations to see. And these are, so these figures are now beginning to describe the electron wave function state in a more faithful way than the Bohr model does. These odd looking shapes are best graphical representation of electron wave function. And uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, cross sections are one of the ways to show it. Um, it. It shows it in two dimensions at different principal quantum numbers, ground state, uh, first excited state, and different values of angular momentum um, magnitude. So this angular momentum zero state are all spherical asymmetric state because this is the state where there's a really zero magnitude angular momentum. And so that's why you see this for cosmetic. Um, with these higher values of angular momentum, they do have to make a choice on what cross section to show you. And it's showing this 
complex electron probability cloud shapes. And um, as far as the visual representation goes, this is the most correct we can get. And if you want something even more correct, you just need the wave function solution. So in terms of lecture, I spent quite a bit of time in section 8.1 and you know, lecture reading guided that level of emphasis. We do cover section 8.2. Um, I think I actually mentioned this in connection to something called a uh, stern gullock experiment earlier on. And uh, this is, section is a great section that kind of recaps what I talked about before. Um, not in the lectures this week, but in a previous virtual class session a couple of weeks ago. So uh, take a look at that. And electron spin, I think I did uh, actually mention this section earlier on when I was telling you that stern gullock description of stern gullock experiment in your textbook section, they are, um, they are physically correct, as in uh, they are right that the stern gullock experiment is the result of electron spin, but um, they are historically incorrect in that they didn't think this, yeah. So, the correct history is that this was one of the experiments that seemed to give support to Bohr's uh, model, which we now realize wasn't, but, but it's a still a fun um, thing to think through. So when you look at uh, um, electron state, there are, your textbook lists of five quantum numbers, but S always being the same, one half for electrons. It's not something that can ever change. There's really four quantum numbers that characterize any electron state, N, L, M, and M sub S. And, um, and in terms of the detailed coverage of electron wave function, we kind of stop with the hydrogen atom because um, there's a saying about helium atoms in physics, it's one electron too many. So, um, so we don't, even in upper division and possibly even graduate school, we don't have any tools to work out exact solution for helium atom. But one thing that will help you figure out, get some sense of understanding about multi-electron states is, um, are the symmetries that these wave functions are required to obey? Um, in the lecture, I go through this in a bit of a more detail. I think in your textbook, they just uh, ended um, um, asserting Pauli's exclusion principle. And, um, and that's fine as far as it goes. In the lecture, I do explain Pauli's exclusion principle in terms of anti-symmetrization requirement for fermions, which I realize uh, for us dealing with the non QED, non relativistic uh, quantum <laughs> mechanics, it's just another unexplained uh, assertion, uh, sub uh, assertion uh, becoming basis for something else. But, um, but it, so I, what I do want you to understand is Pauli's exclusion principle. It's not a rule of thumb. It's not uh, something that sometimes holds, sometimes not. It's a principle that's based on fundamental symmetry of nature. And uh, how that's useful is that this kind of symmetry is something that we can expect to hold even in a very complicated system, like in a multi-electron uh, atom. And, um, and you applying this to multi-electron atom, you can get the, uh, structure of the, you can get the structure of periodic table. And um, so, so I, I think I covered this better in the lecture, <laughs> watch the lecture. Um, so, um, so in terms, so, you know, in chemistry, chemists to figure it out this periodic structure by trial and an error. And what quantum mechanics does now now that chemists have figured out everything is we explain why this must be the case. <laughs> um, so, um, but uh, so, yeah, I guess. Uh, so, so I think that's uh, where, um, where our coverage of chapter eight more or less ends. We don't really spend a lot of I, don't, I think we don't spend almost any time on section 8.5, um, which describes how you can get X-rays from um, decay of heavy um, atoms that's reionizing, but you know, we don't 
yeah, we don't really talk about any of this. Although I think, why is X-ray, this is, why is this in atomic structure? Uh, you know, I will say that I cover what's covered here but as we get started in chapter 10. So, um, I mean, do, you know, read everything. I would never tell you not to read any particular section. Oh, so this we don't really cover. These are X-rays produced in um, uh, high G um, atom, you know, just don't cover. And lasers, um, I kind of covered it in other lectures uh, at other times. Um, and again, I would tell you, uh, skim it, read it for your own reading pleasure, but like I'm not gonna test you on difference between DVDs and Blu-ray. So, so that's chapter eight. It, uh, so this is kind of, I feel like a chapter eight is um, tying up a lot of loose ends because we uh, started in chapter, not even chapter seven, in chapter six, we covered the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom. And if that's where we left the things, it would indeed be um, unsatisfactory because uh, Bohr, uh, Bohr model is wrong. <laughs> it's a semi-classical model that's not 100% correct. So what we cover in section 8.1 is a good um, satisfying conclusion to where we started out with the Bohr model. And the rest of the section gives you some information that I hope if you've taken general chemistry, uh, gives you some nice satisfying connecting points between physics and chemistry. And, um, and, and that's chapter eight. And uh, the remainder of the semester in upcoming weeks, we'll be spending on things that are really properly physics nuclear physics and particle physics, uh, which are a lot of fun. And we are covering all of them at basically conceptual level. So, you know, it'll be a lot of fun. You won't have to deal with the integrals. And I mean, you might have to, but it won't be the main focus of it. And <laughs> you won't have to solve any differential equations, not often. <laughs> so, uh, 